Hello, Sandro. Hi, how are you? I'm good, how are you? I'm good, yeah, thank you. All right, hello, Sandro. Oh, why is this like playing twice? It's like I'm hearing voices in my head. As we're <laughs> streaming, hold on. <laughs> okay. We should be all set. I uh, will see who else joins, but we are also streaming on YouTube. So, all right. Um, well, let's go ahead and go around do some quick introductions. Um, Sandra, do you want to quickly introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your academic journey? Okay, yeah. Um, so my name is Sandra Grasse. I am originally from Portugal, but I live in Dublin in Ireland. And I finished my MSc last year, September 2020 was when it was all done and dusted. And around those last few months of doing the MSc, I got um, uh, happily um, asked by someone that I worked on before, worked with before on a few projects to do the Cochrane training as well and join the Cochrane Review Group. And at the same time, they were helping me with the MSc as well. When I finished the MSc, the conversation started then on applying for the PhD as well. So it is, it is the only school that I'm applying to. It is the only place that I'm applying to, but it's because I really want to go there. And there's one particular researcher that I've been working with for a while and someone else who's on the team as well, who's an expert in the area that I have been studying on, which is PCOS, polycystic ovary syndrome. And uh, at this moment in time, I am writing the research proposal. Wonderful. All right, so I'm gonna quickly just kind of go over the concept for academics and conversation. So this is basically what Danielle and I developed as what we call a live podcast in such a way. Uh, we wanted to create a space where we were able to discuss issues within academia, both personally, professionally, structurally, and cover a variety of topics in a way that wouldn't also require the additional labor to create, say, a podcast, but also to allow some interaction between the people that are joining from accepted society and be able to have a little bit more of an open conversation where it's not just Danielle and I or whatever guests we have on any particular week, but also integrating the, pe the members of accepted society into the conversation and be able to discuss these issues a little bit more openly. And so from there, we are just going to go quickly over some introductions of myself and Danielle, and then we'll kind of go over some, some overviews. Today's topic in particular is introductions and navigating the academic world. We're going to talk a little bit about our individual academic journeys, but also bringing it into a slightly broader conversation about structural challenges that we face within the academy and all of those things. So breaking all of that down. Sure. So just a quick introduction of myself and my role with Accepted. I'm the founder of Accepted Consulting and I am the head of the graduate admissions division for Accepted. I focus primarily on humanities and social sciences and have built out the team in order to cover various aspects of the admissions process from community college all the way through postdoctoral fellowships and all of those things. So that's my role with Accepted. I offer academic planning consultations, graduate admissions consultations, office hours, pro bono services, et cetera. So that's kind of a little bit of an overview about my role at Accepted. And I'm gonna hand it off to Danielle so she can tell you a little bit about what she does. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Caitlin. So I am the head of postdoctoral development here at Accepted and I am also the co-founder of the Accepted Society with Kaylin. So you know, as the head of postdoctoral development, what I do is just trying to serve students once they've entered the academic world and they're trying to figure out what's next. Um, I'm personally I'm a tenure track professor, so I have been through all of the ups and downs of trying to navigate the academic world and the academic job market from fellowships and scholarships and grants while in your PhD or even a master's up through applying for tenure track positions. But because I've had a lot of experience in the academic world so far, I not only offer the consultations for a postdoctoral area or tenure track positions or grants, 
but I also can offer consultations with academic planning, like Kaylin was mentioning she does. And I also do some of the graduate school consultations specifically for social sciences and for STEM because my background is in STEM. Um, and then within the Accepted Society, I do half of everything that we do um, with Kaylin and we're just really excited to bring this to you all now in this new venture that we've got going on. Yes, yeah, so Accepted Society was a program that Danielle and I actually thought about while driving in the car one day. She was talking to me about wanting to work together on a project where we could work on building community. In the academic space, a lot of people stick essentially within their own silos, within their own subject. And what I found with my YouTube channel and with the accountability workshops is that people from across disciplines were finding support and finding ways to actually communicate about their research in a very different way than we would if we were just like, for example, staying within our own cohorts. And so we developed this, I would say like Danielle and I are like the co-founders of Accepted Society, which is, an, um, which is underneath the umbrella of, of Accepted Consulting. But we wanted to build this in order to build community, but also so we can all share our stories and kind of work through this process together as a team. And so I'm gonna quickly go over my own academic journey. Danielle and I are gonna share our, our struggles. We have some questions we put together that we're gonna ask one another and then we're gonna open up the floor. So my academic background began in, I would say in high school where I nearly flunked out. I was told by multiple counselors that if I didn't get my act together, I was not going to graduate and that I would have to repeat my senior year. Luckily, I managed to get in just under the wire and graduate, and then I ultimately took one community college semester, which was at the requirements of my parents, and I basically did flunk out. I got a 2.0 2 GPA, had withdrawals. I was getting a letter from the dean of the college saying, if you do not improve, then you're going to have problems registering for classes in the future, at which point I basically said, you know what, I just don't really think this is for me. College isn't for me. Education's not for me, which is just ironic. And I left the academic world and pursued an athletic career. I loved horses and riding horses from the moment I ever saw one. And I ended up becoming a professional equestrian at the age of 18. I rode professionally for three years. I traveled every weekend to horse shows. I trained sun up, sun down, like 24 hours a day was dedicated to the sport. And I found my way back into education because I was competing all of the time and I would come home and I wasn't feeling entirely fulfilled. So I really loved books and I always loved history. So I began reading these various biographies just for fun. And I started developing all these questions about early America and how it worked and how the politics functioned and why certain people made decisions that they did. And ultimately I ended up having a riding accident which took me out of the saddle for six months and I needed surgery. And during that time, I was like, well, I don't really have anything else to do. I'm going to be recovering and I don't want to like fall into a deep pit of depression. So I'm going to go back to school and find a way to keep my mind occupied. So I went back to community college and I became absolutely obsessed with early America and specifically race relations and gender in early America. And from that point on, I realized that my new goal was to go and transfer. I was really interested in legal history at the time. And so I thought I was gonna to go to college and go directly to law school. That quickly changed when I got into UCLA and fell in love with research. From that point on, I developed an honors thesis with one of my professors. I worked with professors from throughout the university in the history and African-American studies departments. I worked with professors at other universities. And while it had not crossed my mind when I began my academic journey or when I even started in college, as a transfer student, all of my mentors were saying, you should continue pursuing this. And there was something in my gut telling me that I needed to. So I had studied abroad at Cambridge and I remember turning to my friend Zach over lunch one day and I was like, you know what? I think I'm gonna apply. And he's like, you're crazy. Like, why would you wanna go move to England and go pursue a master's? And I was like, I don't know, something's telling me I need to do it. And so I got back, I applied to Oxford and Cambridge and by some miracle, got into Oxford, and that is where 
it really took off. And that is when I also began my YouTube channel and began sharing my academic journey online. And that is where I developed this idea of, of building community with others because I ended up using YouTube and Instagram as a platform for sharing my journey. And that actually connected me to people like Danielle. I actually met Danielle because she had messaged me on Instagram and had talked to me about potentially working on a networking event together. And from that point on, we hopped on a Zoom call and were fast friends, immediately had an immediate connection with her and we wanted to work together in whatever capacity possible. I've now spent a month at her place with her and her husband and my academic journey has now very deeply been intertwined with my work with Accepted and with social media, but also with the friendships that I've developed over time and being able to navigate this academic space with that support network. So I wanted to kind of highlight that, but that's a basic overview of my academic journey. Obviously I went from Oxford and landed a PhD position at Yale. So that is where I am now. I have just completed my first year and am preparing for the second one. So that is where we're at right now. But Danielle, how about you share a little bit about your story? Yeah, absolutely. So I think it's good to kind of just give this background about who I am. Um, I am very white presenting. So I live life as a white woman and the privileges that come with that. But I am Costa Rican, so I'm Latina, but you wouldn't know it by looking at me. Um, my parents immigrated. And when my parents came, went to school, I was a first generation grad student. And that has a lot to do with some of the connections that Kaylin and I have had about struggles and things that we've faced. But kind of taking it back before that, when I was younger, I always had this fascination with the outdoors. Um, and I brought up my family's culture because I think a lot of it is embedded in that. My family in Costa Rica are coffee farmers. And so my dad grew up being outside all the time. And so that's what I did. And I fell in love with nature that way. And I was always that kid that wanted to know why. I would ask a question, I would get an answer from an adult and I was like, but why? <laughs> they're like, eventually they would get to the point they're like, I don't know. Um, I actually, it was a joke that they used to say why not to me as a response because that would eventually get me to stop asking why because I didn't know how to respond to that. <laughs> but um, so my love for nature really just kind of spurred this love for science and wanting to know how things worked when I was in school. But I didn't think that I would ever become a scientist. And I took a course during my senior year of high school. I took an AP environmental studies course. It was one of the two APs that I took because I think, you know, this was before people took so many APs in high school um, like they do now. And I loved it. It challenged me beyond anything else that had ever challenged me. But I was obsessed. And I remember that my teacher telling me, his name is Mr. Keen. And I still talk to him to his day, he and his wife um, telling me, you know, Danielle, like you can do this, like you could be a scientist. And I had never, you know, heard that, didn't know that women could be scientists. I'd loved, I also loved art. So I was like, this is what I'm supposed to do. Like, I'm a girl, like I need to do something that is more feminine in nature. And so he was like, no, I think you should look into science. And because of him to this day, you know, like I said, I still talk to him, I did. And so I was like, well, what type of science do I want to do? And one of the things that I was always fascinated with, I grew up in the mountains in North Carolina was the ocean. And so I decided, I was like, I want to go study marine biology. I love science. I want to learn more about the ocean. Let's go do that. And so I did, I went to UNCW, um, which is the University of North Carolina, Wilmington for anyone's like, what is UNCW? It's on the coast of North Carolina um, to study marine biology. And during that time, I didn't know what I was going to do next. I thought I needed to go to grad school because I was like a scientist go to grad school and they become doctors. Like that's what they do. Um, but I didn't really know why. And like I said, I'm a first generation grad student. So my parents didn't really have that context at the time. I didn't even really know what it meant to be a doctor in terms of having a PhD. Um, and so I was like, okay, well, I went to this one session. I remember if you want to go to grad school is what it was. And I left that session terrified, like absolutely terrified. Cause I was like, I am so far behind. I haven't done these research experiences for undergrad credits. I wasn't prepared. I don't know all of this. And so I 
found the first lab that I could, that I could get research experience in. And I jumped into an honors thesis. I wasn't in the honors college. It was like departmental honors. And so I got to do research looking at hybridization zones with the blue mussel, as in the little animal, the blue mussel. And I got to go out to Maine and do that research. And while I loved it, I felt like something was missing. I mean, it's not hard to tell once you start getting around Kayla and I for a while. I love to talk to people and I love interacting with people. And so I wanted to learn how to bring that love to others. But what I realized is that by doing this marine science research, I was sitting, it's called what they call bench science at a lab bench, taking samples from these little animals and genotyping them, getting all of their DNA out of it and just kind of looking at it and being with myself. And I was miserable. I hated it. And I was like, this is not what I like to do. And so it's like, I've got to find a way to bring it to people. Um, and so I applied to PhD programs at the time, because like I said, this is what I was supposed to do. I was supposed to be a scientist, got a big fat rejection. I didn't know what I was doing. I barely knew that you needed to contact an advisor beforehand. So it was no surprise at all when I look back now that I got rejected. But at the time I was like, what do you mean they rejected me? Like I have like a 4.2 or whatever I had. Like, I was like, this is what? And so, um, but it's a good thing I got rejected. Um, and so I took some time off. I worked for a little bit, moved back home. My ego was a little bruised because like I said, I thought I was going to get in and try to figure out what I wanted to do next. And so I went back to UNCW for a master's degree instead. And I was like, maybe I'll just take some time and do it slower. And I was like, okay, well, maybe I can interact with people through policy. Like I can influence policy and everyone's gonna wanna save the world and earth together. Realized very quickly that I, while I liked it, I couldn't be a politician and be involved in politics. I was not good at playing that game. I was too, I would get so emotional and like worked up about it that I was just gonna be miserable. But I took this one class as a part of it called, the, it was an introduction to environmental education. And I took the class and I walked out of the classroom on the first day and I called my um, uh, boyfriend, who's now my husband at the time. And I was like, I need to switch my major. And he's like, Danielle, you're in your master's. What are you talking about? I was like, I found what I need to be doing, like how to bring the love of nature to people. And so I ended up doing that, but I had gone through a, a year of a master's degree. And so I found a way to basically do extra credits that last year. So that way I could get two degrees at once and not waste that one year before. Cause I was paying for my master's degree. That's the route that I took. And I got to do some really cool research because of that, because I knew I was like, I still wanted to get my doctorate. Um, but at that point I had decided I wanted to be a professor. And so I got to do research in Belize, working with um, a group of people as the social scientists. And they were there trying to reestablish land that had been destroyed um, for farming and wanted to protect it and make it done and do it in a way that respected the cultures of those farmers in the area. And so I got to work with amazing groups of people on that. And then afterwards, I decided I wanted to take some time off from school because I was just a little bit burnt out. So I decided to become an AmeriCorps member. For anyone who's like, what's an AmeriCorps member? Think the Peace Corps, but on American soil. That's truly what it is. And so I was working as an environmental educator, um, trying to increase people's love of the ocean and understanding of the ocean there in the Wilmington, North Carolina area. And at the end of that, I, like I said, I wanted to do a PhD, but the right opportunity hadn't come about. And one of the classrooms that I was working with during my AmeriCorps needed a teacher. And so I jumped into that and I was a sixth grade science teacher for a little while. And I loved how excited students got about being outside and learning science outside. And I knew that I had just found something special. But what was really cool was when my the students siblings or parents would come and they would tell me what their students were learning, what the students were learning about in class. And I hadn't told my students to tell them. I was like, so something interesting is happening here. And I think about how my dad taught me so much about science growing up, even though he didn't call it science at the time. And because of these ideas, I ended up doing my PhD about a year later in intergenerational learning, 
which is the movement of information between people of two different generations. So exactly what I had seen with my students and what I'd experienced with my dad growing up. And I'm sure every single one of you have experienced either teaching someone older than you, someone or them teaching you something. And so I went, got my PhD at NC State University in Parks, Recreation and Tourism Management. After I graduated, I stayed on and was a postdoctoral scholar through the United States Department of Agriculture, but I was still in North Carolina and I was studying intergenerational learning again. For anyone who doesn't know what a postdoc is, think of it like an apprenticeship before becoming a professor or a researcher. And then COVID-19 happened and it was supposed to be a two-year postdoc. Things got held up in terms of the research because every, our world stopped. Um, and I was applying to jobs because I knew funding would end and I didn't know what was gonna happen after COVID. And I ended up landing the job that I have now here at Penn State um, right before the world shut down completely. Um, I actually, my contract, I everything happens for a reason because my contract technically was the last one that was approved by Penn State before they put in a hiring freeze. Um, and so now I'm a joint appointment assistant professor here at Penn State and I'm in the science education department and the rec, parks and rec department because I do environmental education research. Um, and you know, through all of this and through talking to Kaylin and being so inspired by Kaylin sharing her journey, I realized that there's no one out there really that's sharing what it's like to be a professor. Not really. And like I said, I didn't know what needed to go into it. I would just leave sessions terrified because I wasn't prepared enough or because I couldn't afford to do an internship because I couldn't afford to live off of no money. Um, and my parents weren't able to support me. And so I decided to start sharing my journey and now I do. Um, I've taken a little bit of a break as we're getting into the summer, but that's picking up now. And, and now I'm doing this through the accepted consulting and accepted society to continue sharing that journey. Um, and just to show anyone that anyone who wants to be part of academia, they totally can. It's just being shown how to become part of it. So. Wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing your story. And now we have a couple questions that we've laid out for to ask each other, but then we're also going to open up the floor and have Sandra also participate if you're willing. And so the first question that we kind of put together was what specific challenges have you faced structurally in the academic world? And also another facet to this is, has there been any changes due to COVID in the way that academia is structured and the way that your position is structured? Danielle, I feel like this is the perfect question for you. Yeah, so structurally, I think a lot of it has to do with, for me, like in a general sense, it's just not knowing and not having access to the information of what, how to be an academic. Um, you know, the academy is definitely set up for and to benefit white men. That's how it was set up. And there's still a lot of those, I mean, that's who it benefits still to this day. Let's not even pretend that it doesn't. And so because of that, even though I am a white woman and I have the privilege that I could probably even get to the academic world a lot easier because of my, the way society interacts with me, you know, I didn't have access to how to do it. And a lot of that, you know, you think about like parents, you know, um, and I have friends who are professors who their parents were professors and that sort of thing. And that's wonderful. But I think those structures can make it very difficult if you don't have access to it. It's like this insider information that's not shared. Um, things that have changed during COVID, it's just learning how to do what I'm doing now. Um, I tell Kaylin all the time that, you know, I graduated with my PhD, went straight into a postdoc, but then my postdoc technically ended during COVID because it all blew up, just stopped working. And then I got thrown into this academic position, which I'm so grateful for. And I've done my first year remotely at home. You know, I don't even work on campus because they don't allow us at Penn State for safety reasons. And have just been trying to learn how to function as a tenure track assistant professor in this world. Um, so I think it all has to do with just like learning and getting access to things. It seems to be this like exclusive society and group that you only know the information if you're inside of the information in the first part and somehow you have to prove yourself. Um, so that's what I would say like structurally is the hardest thing. What about you, Kaylin? So there's a couple different things, but I would say like access to information and kind of the gatekeeping of information 
is a huge issue within the academy and also just kind of institutional knowledge. One thing that I noticed in particular when I was at UCLA is my access to information was far greater than those that were commuter students. UCLA is a partially near or on campus school, but there are also many commuters from the LA region, in which case I noticed that I was able to go to office hours while some of my friends were not because they had to commute during the day in order to get to and from school. And so those types of like institutional barriers where it's just it, your access to information is very much based on where you are in relation to the university plays a large role on top of other barriers in relation to like if you are a first generation student or if you're coming from a background where you have not been taught to actually communicate with professors and ask for this type of information. There's this idea within the academy, which I think is is somewhat toxic, which basically states that, well, if you want the information, you should be able to go out and get it. But there are people that know how to engage in those types of conversations and seek out that information and know where that information can be found while others do not. And that creates a significant barrier to information, which is part of what we wanted to discuss here today. But on top of that, for me, structural issues also included things like knowing about funding. I was a community college transfer student. Nobody told me about funding deadlines. And there are multiple opportunities for scholarships for transfer students that I wasn't even aware of until after the deadline, in which case I was out of luck. And it's the same thing with when I was applying to Oxford. Had I known that I would have increased my likelihood of gaining funding by 40% if I had applied just a month and a half earlier, I would have totally changed my overall trajectory and it would have meant that I would have would not have ended up with so much significant debt and all of those things it's all about institutional knowledge and the way that certain information is being kept from students that just don't know where to look and it's not necessarily that it's purposely hidden it's that the institution isn't aware that these barriers exist for certain types of students because they it was built around a particular model to begin with and so I would say those types, as a first generation graduate student, those were things that I did not have access to and was not aware of. And now that I am aware of them, I make it my mission with my YouTube channel and with Accepted in particular to make this information known to others because I don't want other students to land in this much debt and to land in positions where they are unable to manage this, this choice, this academic path that they've chosen for themselves. And so there's like multiple layers to that. And I could like go on and on and on, but that's, that's kind of the things that come to mind when I first think of that question. And then I know we've already kind of talked about access to information, um, but how can we, what can we do as a community, like as accepted society, as the YouTube community that we've developed in order to break down some of those barriers. Of course, I've already talked about how with my clients, I, I am making them aware of certain deadlines and information that may not be readily apparent on websites and those types of things. But what else can we do to support one another in such a way that's actually useful? What do you think, Danielle? So I think the first thing is continuing to just be in community with each other. And I know that sounds so simple, but it's also complicated. And when has it become as complicated as it is now during COVID? I mean, there is some simplicity now. Now we can all get together over Zoom, over virtual meetings. Like, you know, if you'd asked us a year and a half ago, that was few and far between that we had those. But now we do it every single day. And we <laughs> have a lot of Zoom fatigue because of it. But I think a big thing is just, communicating and staying connected. Um, I've been noticing a pattern over the past few years that academics in general, they've changed a lot as the generation of academics have, have aged out, as certain generations have aged out, so to speak. You know, they have a lot of millennial aged academics who are coming in and there are a lot of things that they aren't willing to accept about the old school and the old boys institutions um, that I think they need to be overturned, um, you know, and so talking about these things, not making it seem like it's so elitist and it's only for those who are privileged. I mean, you even see it in the way that, um, 
you hear about it, you hear about it on TikTok all the time as a joke when people are talking about their professors, that the younger professors will be like, yeah, my name is Dr. So-and-so, but I go by Danielle and you, or like, you know, their first name. Um, and that's not something that used to always happen, particularly when it comes to like the old guard, so to speak, if we want to use that um, terminology. So I think it's being in community and not being afraid to ask questions and talking about these things, getting the information out, making it not the, making it basically the norm that information is shared about these things and helping each other out instead of competing against each other um, and letting everyone know that they can all have a piece of this pie, this weird, crazy, antiquated pie known as academia. Absolutely. So I want to open up the floor a little bit and Sandra, if you have anything that you would like to contribute in relation to things about community or other types of structural barriers, I'd love to hear your feedback and your experience. Yeah, I think that it's really interesting to see the similarities between, you know, different aspects that you can then relate to. Oh, yeah, I, I don't know what it means from your side because I wasn't there. I don't know that experience, but I'm, I'm there, you know, you're sharing something. And I'm like, yeah, been there, done that. And Danielle is saying stuff. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I've, I've been told that, too. So from my side, it's funny, like even hearing your story. So I started the YouTube channel, which was a project for my first semester during the MSC. And I still remember. So this is you know, just a funny story of I'm, I'm kind of like the. I'm always called the crazy one because are you sure you want to do that? That sounds a bit crazy. But the person who was the lecturer on that particular module, I have her job now. <laughs> I'm the lecturer on that module now. And still, to you know, I can go back. And I still remember one particular time when I explained what I wanted to do and why I wanted to do it. And her words were, but why? And my idea with the YouTube channel was like, I'm really sick and tired of people saying that, yeah, you know, there's no community in our, you know, in our profession and we don't really know what everybody else is doing. And there's this super group of experts that we know about them and doing research, but, you know, they can't be touched. And I'm like, are you, are you sure? Because I, I got to network with some of them, you know, and sometimes all it took was an email and, I, you know, I joke this with, with Siobhan and I say, like, I'm just a guy from a small village in Portugal. Like, how how is it possible for me to do this? And everybody else says that, no, that can't be done. So I like challenging these things and kind of putting it out there and sometimes with ideas. And, and I, I, yeah, I put my hand up and say that, no, not all of my ideas were successful. Yeah. But that one with YouTube channel was just an idea to show everyone that, maybe the idea that you have of our community and what we do, maybe that's just because you're not out there and seeing these things happening. And I, yeah, I can really go back to that point and seeing how things change and really having the network. Like my first job and how I got into evidence-based acupuncture was because of being like the official job title was the director of social media because there was no one else that they could think of you know who knows everyone and still the joke goes around that oh you know everyone around everywhere like i'm in ireland i did my msc with the, uh, the college in uh, the uk and now i'm applying for my phd in australia and even that you know in conversation that came up with danielle you know i still have people going that's really hard and really complicated why don't you just go an easier way and I'm like, I don't want the easier way. I want that particular place because it, it can be done. And, you know, for now, you know, I want to keep believing that it can be done because of the connections, because of putting yourself out there and not being afraid of, you know, sometimes you're just going to be proven that your idea wasn't great. So what? You know, find another idea. So I think that it's really refreshing to find you and find this idea and this concept of sharing what you've gone through you know I'm, I'm really and honestly like one of the things that I really enjoyed about watching the, the you know your videos to start with was I I, I didn't know you and you know I, I don't know you right like we've seen each other online a few times but it's like yeah you're telling other people what I want to tell them because I could sit there and watch your videos and go oh it's it's easy for you because you're already doing it you know, you're only saying that because it's easier for you. But I was writing, you know, during 
you know, the pandemic, I was writing my dissertation. I had done my data collection. I was really struggling, you know, even mentally. And I needed that support. And you didn't know about that, but you were the support, right? And I kind of found that I just needed someone to be able to, like you did, to tell everybody else that, no, it's not easy. And it's okay to tell others that it's not easy. I'm you know, and <laughs> makes <me> so happy <laughs> to hear that you like you found it to be so useful and that you found connection with my videos because that's what I wanted with my channel. And this last year, if anything, has taught me, especially, and I'm sure we can all relate, how incredibly isolating this path can be and how the doubts of others can play into your perception of being isolated. And I found that with YouTube, it wasn't just a, a way for me to express myself creatively, but I found that I was being able to connect with people like Danielle and build these friendships where I was feeling supported in the academy. And I did feel like I had ideas that were valid and that I could talk through my thoughts and think out loud. And I think that's one thing that was was significantly lacking. And one thing that I found with the way that people were commenting on my YouTube videos and the messages that I was getting is that I wasn't just feeling this myself. And I was, I was very honest about what I was going through the, the entire process. I mean, I can go back and rewatch my videos and I can still feel all of the emotions that I was feeling in that particular day or that particular week, the frustrations, the anger, the sadness, like all of, and the excitement, like all of those things all boiled into one. And that's what I found to be so exciting about being on YouTube and using this as a platform as a connecting point, because I, I have watched YouTubers that really just try to kind of glorify either the academic experience or whatever type of lifestyle content they create. And while I think that in, it does play some positive role and like it is aspirational, I didn't want my content to be that overall. I wanted it to be a way for me to connect with people and to show that there are parts of this that are wonderful and are great and are Ex extremely exciting. And then there's moments where I feel so out of place and I feel so doubtful in my own ability and that I'm facing these issues within my work, within my brain, like all of these things are what I'm experiencing, in which case I was like, I, I can't be the only one there. There's got to be other people out there that are, are feeling the same way as I am. Absolutely. I cannot agree with that more. Um, Caitlin, we actually have a few questions that have come in from the YouTube live. Should we answer those? Yeah, go for it. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So let's see. So someone asked, do you have to have a research topic selected before the application for STEM courses? So I think I'll let you that one, take that one, Caitlin. Yeah. So this honestly, it, I, I know I'm going to say this a lot. It depends. It depends on the course. It depends on the program. There are some that are going to be very lab based, in which case you are connecting your interests and your kind of long-term aspirations with your research to the mission and the work of that lab. But there are others that you really design your own research. It depends on where you're at. For example, if you're gonna be applying to three-year PhD programs that are say in the UK, then your research is gonna be more at the forefront of what it is that you are doing, even though you are embedded within a lab. Whereas in the US, you are likely going and working in somebody else's lab, your advisor's lab, in which case you need to tie your, your interests in with what they are currently doing. So you don't have to have the research project fully formed in the same way that you would if you applied for the humanities. Like if you're applying for the humanities or the social sciences, say in anthropology or in history, you would really need to have your methods, your research proposal, all of those things really well fleshed out. But in STEM, it, it varies depending on the program. So I, I apologize for the, the kind of vague answer, but generally my, my answer in, in this regard is it depends. <laughs> Feeling, you know, you've become a true academic when your answer is it depends. That's the joke yeah. that we always say it depends. <laughs> well, it depends. 
And Anchita, I apologize if I'm mispronouncing your name. You've had a follow-up question is if instead of research experience, is it okay if you have teaching experience? I mean, all of your experiences are valuable, but it's going to be that same thing that it depends. It depends on what um, that program really values. But then a lot of times they know that you're not going to have a ton of research experience. So it's just highlighting your research ideas and what you can bring to the table in those cohorts. So it's going to depend for sure. And Alex, you said you're getting your PhD at UNCW. That's cool. <laughs> Small world. Um, so Anthony, you said, congrats on your job, Danielle. Thank you very much. Was that the kind of job you managed, but imagined before or while getting the PhD and what resources pointed you in that direction? So yes and no. Um, I had gotten to the point, like I think I mentioned if you were here at the beginning that I knew that I wanted to be a scientist and in my head scientists had PhDs. But a lot of it's because I fell in love with research and I wanted to do research. And so what I thought I knew, I was just told by people that like, you know, you should consider going and getting your PhD um, and specializing and having your own research topic. And I just thought that that was really interesting. And like I said, I was the kid who wanted to know why and more. And so how could I be a professional learner? And so I never imagined though, that I would have the job that I have now. Like if you had told me a year and a half ago that I'd be in Pennsylvania, I would have laughed at you and thought it was just a total joke. I mean, so much so, for an example, this is a story time here and it's the importance of networking. I went to a conference, a lot of conferences for students across all subjects and disciplines will have mentor programs set up for young academics and students and older academics. I always signed up for that because I was like, it's just important to network. And one of the professors that I got assigned to at a conference year, feels like years ago now, it was years ago. Um, I sat down with him. It was two of us talking to this individual and he, it was his first year as a professor. He is now my colleague. And at the time I had no idea. He told me what department he was in and the college he was in and the type of research he's doing. And I wrote off in my head that I was like, okay, well, it's good to meet this person for me to have this network. I'm never going to apply to that institution or that department or that program ever. And that next year they were searching for someone. Did I apply or even ask questions about it? No, because I had written it off in my head. The following year, which was the year that I applied for this position that I'm in now, no, two years later, they searched for it again. And I was like, there's no way they're going to even look at me. I didn't even think about the mentor that I'd had at the conference. And it was my dean of the college that I was in. He used to be my department head when I was opposed to a doctoral student, sent me the job. And he's like, I think you'd be competitive for this. And I remember my advisors responding back to me because he sent it to both of us. He's like, well, Danielle, you're applying for it. If the dean told you you're applying for it. And I was like, okay. <laughs> so I... <laughs> you know, no, I never thought I would have this job and or a joint appointment position, which is what I have. You know, you ask a lot of the older professors out joint appointments and they will tell you horror stories. But I feel like you find that with any part of academia, someone's going to have a horror story about it. But, you know, I am where I'm supposed to be. And I can do a whole series about joint appointment positions at some point. I'll make the YouTube videos on it, actually. So you should definitely go watch them. But no. So yes and no. And then what led me in that direction? Sometimes it was people just telling me. Sometimes it was a lot of soul searching. Um, there have been many times, many, many times that I sat during my PhD and I was like, why am I doing this? Like, I would call my mom and be like, so I've decided I'm gonna become a dietitian and I'm gonna drop out of school and go do a new program. And she'd be like, she just gotten used to like hearing it because she was, it was just like self-doubt and imposter syndrome. So there's a lot in there. Um, Kaylin, I think this is a good question for you. What is your opinion on post baccalaureate programs as a stepping stone towards a PhD program? Yeah, so post bacs are a great way to get additional research experience if you did not get it in undergrad or during a master's program. I think post bacs are really beneficial. You just need to use them strategically. You need to make sure that it's going to be the right fit and that you are able to develop work that you think is going to help you as a stepping stone to that PhD program. It's going to give you the experience and the methods and techniques necessary for you to feel like a competitive applicant. That being said, um, every post back is ever so slightly different. There are some programs that I uh, will look at it more favorably than others. That being said, it will never be looked at negatively. <laughs> it's just to, it's just a matter of making sure that you're using that as a 
a logical stepping point, a step off point for what it is that you plan on sitting. For example, I've had, I think three clients that I've helped apply for post back positions. One of them was actually looking to essentially re uh, to, to pivot to a different discipline and to very different methods. And so instead of doing a master's, which she couldn't afford to do, we helped her apply to post back positions in order to help her kind of develop those techniques. So that way she would be competitive in the long run. So especially if you are somebody who's looking to not do a master's before your PhD, I think it's a great option. And if you need any help with looking at post backs, then please feel free to reach out to me. No, absolutely. Um, and, you know, another good point, I was told this when I was during my master's program that the point of a master's degree is to teach you how to do science. And the point of a PhD is for you to contribute to theory. So yep. to the body of science. And so postdocs can also help with that if you're not doing a master's program in between. Um, let's see here, you know, Anchita asks again, how long before sending an application should we contact advisors and how to contact for international students? So we're going to repeat that it depends. Um, I'm gonna let Kaylin speak to the Oxbridge timeline because that is not something that I'm familiar with. Um, but I can speak to more US centric programs. You know, most of them, if you were applying for fall, like you're wanting to start in a fall term, most of the time those applications are going to be due right around December 15th. And so you want to be contacting your, the advisors when they're working. So sometimes that may not be during the summer, depending on the university and what the, that professor's program, research program is like, or they might be out in the field. So I'd say like right before this fall semester starts, start reading, reaching out to them via email. There is a really great free potential advisor email template free on acceptance website that you can look at and it will help you fill it in, you know, customize it. You want it to be very personal to you too, but you want to have, be having conversations with these potential advisors. They, you know, people, I don't know if everyone understands, but you will have a connection with your advisor for your entire career in some way, their network, their research, their projects. And so you want to make sure it's somebody who you can get along with. I make the joke all the time with my students that it's like being an academic parent of sorts. And so there's times that you are not going to get along with them and that you are not going to like them and you're going to avoid them. And there are times that they are going to be the one there to support you if you need that, like in ways that you need support. So you want to make sure that you're going to work well with them. But the Oxbridge timeline is a little bit different. So Kaylin. So if you're going to be applying to the UK or the EU, the timeline changes ever so slightly, um, being that they start later, typically. And also the deadlines for PhD programs varies significantly in the US, or sorry, in the UK or in the EU or in international universities, such as, for example, in Australia, who's on a completely different timeline. So you just want to make sure that you're looking ahead of time at where like where they actually fall within the academic calendar. That being said, I would recommend that you are reaching out to them at least three months before you're about to submit your application. This gives them enough memory of your name and the conversation that you had, but also gives you enough time to be respectful of their time. You wanna make sure that you are being respectful of the time that they are giving you in response to your emails or even getting on a call with you. And you wanna make sure that you're timing it in such a way that you are speaking to them at the very beginning of whatever like fall term semester that they are on because you want to get it done before they have the mass of course load and administrative duties and while they are actually required to check their email. So in the US, it's typically, I recommend that my clients reach out to potential advisors in August. And if you're going to be applying to Oxbridge specifically, where the applications for PhDs are due in December in order to be considered for funding, I would recommend you start reaching out to them in September. Oftentimes they begin their official appointment at the end of September, early October. So that's kind of the general timeline that I would recommend. So we're going to answer one more question and then we're going to go ahead and wrap up for today. But do you want to go ahead and read off the last question, Danielle? Yeah, sure. Um, so there's one for you specifically, but it's about a specific applying for an application. So I would say definitely contact Kaylin for consulting um, through Accepted about applying for a specific program at Oxford. But then there's another question is, you know, COVID has stopped like working, like work has stopped because of COVID and, you know, with lab-based subjects 
and someone's finishing their master's, but they haven't gotten the full experience. And so will that be taken into consideration for students for PhD programs? I think we should both answer, Ken. I'm gonna answer from my perspective as an advisor and someone who sits on those committees. And then I wanna hear what you have to say too. So I would say you don't want to be working with anybody. That's gonna be my advice. Who is it gonna take into consideration, honestly? Um, you know, I would there find one university in the entire world right now that's not been impacted by COVID and you're not going to find it. Um, and so, yes, they do know, but that's where you can talk about it in your application pieces. That's where making those connections with those advisors beforehand. A lot of times it's not just going to be over email. You know, when students email me, potential students, I email them back and be like, let's set up a time to Zoom so we can just chat and see how we communicate with each other. But yes, they absolutely are going to be taken into consideration. Now, something to keep in mind is that we do not know what funding, the impact of COVID is gonna be on funding for a lot of universities. Um, I can you know, speak to Penn State, I can't speak to other um, institutions, but funding is tight and there are a lot more people who are gonna be going back to school. Um, we've seen this happen historically when there've been recessions or just really big impacts to our globe. And so it's gonna be very competitive. So you wanna make sure that you are doing everything to set yourself up to be competitive. And a lot of times it's just reaching out to people, you know, through the resources, through accepted, talking to those advi potential advisors and making connections with them and just making sure that whatever you do, please just don't apply without contacting anyone. Like that's my biggest tip. We remember those names because we're immediately like, wait, what, like who? So just please make sure that you um, take the time to get to know people. Yeah, so in terms of, so as Danielle said, every program is going to consider the fact that many of the students applying this year, actually almost all students applying this year have been affected by COVID in some way, shape or form. History students have had zero access to archives in person. There are scientists that have not had access to labs. There are psychologists who have not had access to actually being able to perform in-person studies. Like anthropologists haven't been able to go do their ethnographic work. All of us have been limited by COVID, in which case they are gonna take it into consideration. And there are ways that I am helping my clients actually craft their statements in order to discuss the challenges that you have faced with COVID in a way that actually is a positive. Because you're gonna demonstrate that you have certain skills and you've been able to navigate this space within these limitations and that you have use that in order to prepare in these ways for your future project. So if you want to discuss those strategies, then go ahead and head over to Accepted. I know we got a question about future opportunities to ask questions. You are always welcome to shoot us an email at Accepted Consulting. Also, I offer office hours. They are totally free. You can sign up on the website at acceptedconsulting.com. Additionally, you can sign up for consultations with myself or with Danielle or with anybody else on the team. As we said at the beginning, I cover humanities and social science grad student admissions. Danielle is focused on STEM and social sciences. And we have also just hired a new STEM focused grad student admissions consult sorry, consultant. So she is actually joining starting next week. So please feel free to check out the website for any additional information, but I'm going to go ahead and end off the live here. Thank you all so much 